Hello, everyone. Welcome to the HPL seminar this week. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eric Honnert. Eric started his undergraduate in 2010 at the Valparaiso University Mechanical Engineering, where he primarily worked on how the upper extremity contributes to daily life activities. Then in 2014, he received a bachelor's degree in engineering in addition to a minor degree in Spanish. Then he started um, his research as a graduate student at the Vanderbilt University under the supervision of Dr. Carl Zelig, who gave um, a nice talk in the HPL seminar in a, about a couple months ago. When Eric was there, he primarily worked on ankle and foot biomechanics during walking, which I believe it was presented in the HPL seminar a couple of years ago. After he received a PhD degree in 2019, he came here to the University of Calgary as a postdoc working with um, Dr. Ben O'Neill. Eric's research interests have been in um, how um, high performance of footwear affects running biomechanics and how prolonged running changes biomechanics in the lower limb. When I asked him about a scientific accomplishment that he's been most proud of, he mentioned about a mathematical derivation which provides a, an understanding of a metric that can be used to quantify foot and prosthesis kinetic contributions. Aside from academic career of Eric, he also mentions that he loves challenging and pushing his physical limits. He loves cross-country skiing and rock climbing, training three to four days per week. He also says that um, he set a summer goal for trail running, such as a finishing 50 kilometer loop by Assiniboine Mountain and Marble Lake. Today, Eric is giving a talk entitled as the biomechanics of long duration running and performance footwear, whenever you are ready. My talk today represents a combination of academic and industry funded research. And a portion of this research shown today was funded by the Li Ning Shoe Company. Can you see my screen? Um, I actually only see black, now I see the cover uh, the, the title page and the laser point. Alrighty, so over the past three years, there's really been this development of these long distance shoes. And this started off with a Nike Vaporfly shown here in the middle. In this shoe, uh, researchers have shown that it reduces the metabolic cost of running by about 4%. Now, other companies have also started to integrate similar uh, mechanisms and designs in, uh, that the Nike Vaporfly has, such as higher stack heights, more resilient midsoles, and carbon fiber plates in order to allow athletes to you know, push their performance and attain their goals. Now I see these different iterations of shoes as part of this roadmap into developing these high performance and optimal shoes. And so these shoes kind of go here in the middle where currently we're trying to understand uh, what's going on with these high performance shoes. And so we create different iterations of these shoes in order to understand the mechanisms that affect performance. And this is now an iterative loop where we continuously build new and different shoes and we don't necessarily know a priori that some of these mechanisms are going to work, some of these mechanisms aren't. And so that's why I view this as a constant development uh, loop here. Now also informing these, this optimal shoe development is understanding long distance running biomechanics. So without understanding what's going on as a run progresses, we can't build a shoe that addresses an individual's need. Now, at the end of the day, as we understand and get more information regarding both long distance biomechanics and the mechanisms that affect long distance performance, we can build these optimal shoes 
for long distance. Now there has been some work in terms of long distance running biomechanics. So in 2018, Sano and colleagues started examining the distribution of lower limb joint work throughout a run. Now here I've shown the positive work at the beginning of the run on the left side of the screen. And the ankle positive work, which is generated through the tricep surrey, is the main contributor to uh, running here. And as the run progresses, we actually see that the amount of positive work from the ankle actually decreases. Now this is thought to be detrimental to the running economy as the ankle is a very economic source of positive work. However, there's still an open question about what's going on with the foot and the shoe. So the foot is directly interacting with these new high performance shoes, and yet we don't have all that much information in terms of what's going on biomechanically with the foot. So during shorter bouts of running, there have been characterizations, say, of the positive and negative work performed by the foot and the lower limb joints. So for instance, the positive work can be generally thought of as concentric contractions that are, or work provided through concentric contractions of the lower limb joint muscles. Again, such as at the ankle, this is provided by the tricep surrey, and you can think similarly for the knee and the hip here. Now, in terms of the negative amount of work, these are generally thought to be performed by concentric or, con or eccentric contractions, I apologize. And for the foot that I've shown here, this is the net amount of work that's coming from the foot and the work sources within the foot. So in the terms of the negative work, that includes both the foot joints and the MTP and mid-tarsal joints. Now, both the ankle and the foot contribute a large amount of both this positive and negative work throughout running. And so we need to start to understand what's going on, especially with the foot throughout the run. Now, during long duration running, the amount of negative footwork or the absorption perform performed by the foot and the soft tissues may decrease throughout a run as runners with fatigued tibialis anteriors tend to contact the ground with a less dorsiflexed ankle. This, uh, this difference in contact angle would then influence how the foot is interacting with the ground right at foot contact. So this tibialis anterior fatigue has been observed through a change in the EMG intensity and a decrease in the EMG frequency. So the first study I'm going to go through today is looking at these biomechanical changes throughout a varying speed and long duration run when we're looking at the ankle, the foot, and the tibialis anterior changes. So more specifically, we had 14 subjects come into lab and run on an instrumented treadmill. We had markers on their lower limb in order to track how their segments move relative to one another. Combining this segment motion and the forces from our instrumented treadmill, we are able to understand the foot and ankle kinetics that are evolving and changing throughout this run. So all of our subjects here were heel striking runners and they had 10K times between 45 and 70 minutes. Each of these runners performed the following protocol shown on the bottom here. So first of all, they had a five minute warm up that I didn't show on this screen. And that was just to familiarize them with running on the treadmill. Next, all the runners performed uh, or started running at 2.8 meters per second. And they ran at this speed four times throughout the run. And this was just to understand how the ankle and foot kinetics change regardless of running speed. We then had these uh, bouts of running where all subjects ran at variations of their uh, 10K speed. So they ran at 90 to 110 percent of their 10K speed, and they ran at this for 15 minutes three times throughout the run. 
Now we set up this protocol in order to understand how a runner changes their biomechanics throughout speed changes. As you know, when you go outside to run, you're not running at just a constant speed. You're not running on a treadmill. When you're running outdoors, you're constantly changing your speeds. And we wanted to understand if those speed changes affected the, the lower limb biomechanics. So first of all here, we have the, uh, the ankle power, and this is over percent stance. So we have 0% indicating foot contact and 100% indicating toe off. And the darker colors on this graph indicate that more time has progressed throughout this run. And for just simplicity's sakes, I've shown the 2.8 meter per second speed here. Now, first of all, we're going to look at this positive portion of the ankle power curve. And again, this is from the ankle plantar flexing muscles, such as the tricep surrey. Now, as the run progressed, we see that there's a decrease in the amount of positive work provided through the ankle. And this is about five and a half joules. Now, this is not the first time that this has been shown. Again, Sano and colleagues showed this in 2018, but this is a nice verification of previous studies that have shown similar trends. So next, looking at the foot power. So we attach markers on the rear foot of all the subjects here. And similar to how we can quantify the ankle power through the interaction of the shank and the rear foot, we can quantify this foot power as an interaction between the rear foot and the ground. Now, this foot power is a net estimate of everything that's going on within the foot, such as plant or soft tissues in and around the foot, such as the plantar fat pad or the compression provided by the shoe or the mid tarsal joint and the metatarsal phalangeal or toe joint. So here on the left is a characteristic curve of this foot power, again from foot contact to toe off. And on the right we have a runner here, uh, and I just have shown a couple steps in order to illustrate this foot power. So first of all, right near foot contact here, there's this absorption going on at the foot. And this can be thought of as the soft tissues in and around the foot, so mainly contributed by the absorption from the shoe. Next, more towards mid stance, there's this absorption still going on. And this is provided both by soft tissues or from the shoe cushioning and from the mid tarsal joint. Then in late stance, there's a combination of all three of these sources, such as these soft tissues that are still compressing and releasing throughout uh, the run. Also, the main power contributor within the foot, the mid tarsal joint, has a great amount of positive power during this phase. And then also the metatarsal phalangeal joint. So for this later part of uh, of running here, this push-off phase. Again, uh, darker colors indicate that more time has passed throughout this run. We see, interestingly, that the amount of positive footwork increased throughout the run. Now, this increase partially offsets the amount of ankle work uh, if we compare, say, time equals six to time equals 57, as there's an increase of about two joules of work being performed by the foot. And this can maybe be thought of as an increased contribution from those intrinsic foot joints. And this is one of the first mechanisms that I wanna point out today, is that adding carbon fiber plates, such as uh, these high performance shoes integrate into their midsoles, can actually mitigate the amount of foot joint work. That means that these high performance shoes are, can be beneficial in terms of reducing the amount of biological work that needs to be performed throughout a run. 
So next, on to this uh, earlier phase here. And we see actually just at this fastest running velocity, so at the 110% of the 10K speed, that there was a reduction in the amount of negative foot joint or negative foot work going on. And this could be thought of as a reduction in the amount of uh, shoe cushioning and foot soft tissues that are absorbing during this early phase of running. Now, I became interested and wondered, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? And so this is the reason why we looked at the tibialis anterior activation. So we had this dulcis trigno sensor um, attached on all of our subjects. And from the raw signal, we performed a wavelet transform. And this wavelet transform decomposes this signal into an EMG power as we're with a function Sorry, this wavelet transform decomposes the signal into an EMG power as a function of time and frequency. We then performed a principal component analysis, which is a data reduction technique. And we did this just to see the major contributors within this tibialis anterior activation. From here, and using this principal component analysis, we examined two frequency bands, both a low frequency band and a high frequency band. And here we see that the low frequency band was between 21 and 34 Hertz, whereas the high frequency band was between 46 to 435 Hertz. Please, please notice that on my X axis, they're a little bit different this time. Whereas we go from 50% of stance time before foot contact and 0% still indicates foot contact and toe off. And interestingly, we actually see that there's this increased activation in this low frequency intensity. So this causes a shift in terms of the major frequencies at play. Whereas at this higher frequency, there was really little to no differences going on. Now here I've highlighted where foot contact occurs on these plots, which is indicated by this red line. And there seems to be this difference in between before foot contact and after foot contact, specifically with this increase in the low frequency intensity. So this could indicate that the tibialis anterior is mitigating the amount of absorption being performed by the foot. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that this is actually showing a difference between eccentric contractions and concentric contractions. So before foot contact, there's a concentric contraction being performed by the tibialis anterior. Whereas after foot contact, there's an eccentric contraction being performed. Now, Roger Noka has a, a very nice summary article examining different, uh, these eccentric versus concentric contractions, which starts to examine that different motor unit action potentials may be at play in these different types of muscle contractions. However, this is still an open question in terms of why that there is this increase going on in the tibialis anterior. So just as a summary of things or observations that we observed, is that we saw that again, the positive ankle work decreased throughout the run and the positive footwork increased. At, fa at the fastest running speeds, we also saw a decrease in the amount of negative footwork. And also we saw a shift in the activation frequency of the tibialis anterior. Now it should be noted that these differences were uh, observed in recreational runners. There are two studies that show that uh, elite runners over a long duration run do not have a decrease in this ankle positive work, yet there remains an open question in terms of the amount of positive footwork uh, if that positive footwork changes in these elite runners or not. So next, 
I'm, I've become more curious about these soft tissues in and around the um, in and around the foot and the shoe here. And the second part of my talk today is dedicated to some preliminary analyses that I've done with respect to the shoe cushioning. And specifically, I'm wondering how does this footwear absorption in the shoe cushioning affect our lower limb biomechanics? So as many of us have seen this uh, study where they are, where Wooter Hochhammer in 2018 examined the Nike Vaporfly or the Nike prototype here, as it was known then, versus the Nike Streak and the Adidas Adios Boost, which were both marathon shoes at the time that this Nike prototype or Nike Vaporfly shoe had a reduced energetic cost of running. Now, there are many, or many new things that, and many new mechanisms that the Nike Vaporfly integrated, but one of these was the elastic midsole. Specifically, the authors of that original paper stated that the elastic properties of the Nike prototype shoes or Nike Vaporfly shoes provide the best explanation for the metabolic savings. Now, I think that this is partially true, and I think that more the deformable midsole may contribute to performance. So here on the left is some material testing that uh, Hukamer did in their studies, and it showed that the Nike Vaporfly deformed by 12 millimeters. Now, this is six more millimeters than the competitor shoes at the time. And interestingly, during this early stance phase or during the first half of stance, there was a reduction in the amount of ankle work and the amount of five to nine joules. And this may be due to this deformation uh, performed by the shoe. So if we would think about this deformation, here I've shown a work, uh, work over time plot. And this is just an illustration of what could be going on in this midsole. So in, right, in early stance, there's going to be this midsole compression going on in the heel, and then it could you know, stay at that compression for a little bit, and then eventually it's going to recoil. Now, if we look at the derivative of this curve with respect to time, or the power, and this is going to be more indicative of the plots that I'm going to show you with this footwork, that we actually see this negative power due to midsole compression, followed by the positive power uh, during for midsole recoil. Now I'm just going to touch today on this midsole compression aspect, because I think that this is more similar and similar to that foot power metric that I've been showing today. So, I became interested in, in wondering, can this midsole compression offset the amount of ankle work? So this is some preliminary analyses from studies that are ongoing inside of our lab, where we have runners uh, over ground wearing three different shoes and they're running at 3.3 meters per second here. And again, you see that we have mo motion capture markers and they're running over instrumented force plates here. And they're running in this Adidas Boost, an Asics gel shoe, and this new leaning hollow shoe. And we can see that this leaning hollow shoe from these material tests deform more than the other shoes. And so I would expect to see that there would be more absorption being performed by this shoe in early stance. So again, this missile compression, I think, is going on during this initial foot power phase here, this initial 20% stance phase. And it may be offsetting in terms of the ankle power at the same time. So in terms of this footwork in this first 20% stance phase, we actually see that the leaning, which displaced the most on our material testing, had the most absorption going on. So with respect to the other two shoes, there was four joules more 
work being absorbed by the cleaning shoe than the Adidas and the Asics. As well, we can see that this footwork offsets the amount of ankle work that's being simultaneously uh, contributed. So this means that the ankle work is performing less or that the ankle is performing less work, meaning that the biological tissues such as the tibialis anterior have to, have to perform less work in order to perform the same task. Oh, I don't know what happened there. I apologize. So if we look at the entire negative stance phase, we actually see that the foot uh, or that the amount of negative work performed by the leaning shoe is again the greatest and again can displace at least with respect to the ASIC shoe in terms of the amount of negative work performed. Again, this means that the, or the biological tissues about the ankle do not have to perform as much work in the leaning shoe, say, against the ASIC shoe. Now, I've also become interested in this with respect to these elite marathon shoes as well, in terms of if this amount of footwork can offset the ankle work. So right now, again, we have some preliminary studies going, or some studies going on that we're just in the start of. And so we have two subjects running on an instrumented treadmill at 90% of their lactate threshold. And here we're actually comparing the Nike Vapor Flies, the Brooks Hyperion Elite, and a neutral shoe, which is just a standard shoe that's on the market. And here we see over the entire negative portion of the foot curve, of the foot power curve, that both the uh, Hyperion Elite and the Vaporfly, those marathon shoes for subject one and for subject two, absorb the most amount of work in this early stance phase. And in terms of the negative work performed by the ankle, the neutral shoe is performing the most followed by both of these shoes. So again, this means that the amount of biological work performed by the ankle is reduced in these marathon shoes, and this may be attributed to that compression performed by the shoe. So this is another mechanism that may be affecting performance is that these deformable midsoles can offset the amount of biological ankle work. So quickly back to this roadmap here that we're looking at these long distance running shoes and we've started to understand at least a little bit more in terms of what's going on with long distance running biomechanics and some of the mechanisms, not even, not all of the mechanisms, but just some of them that are at play in these high performance shoes. So specifically in our long distance running biomechanics, we saw a decrease in the amount of positive ankle work and an increase in the amount of positive footwork. We saw that also these carbon fiber plates that are integrated into these high performance shoes can mitigate the amount of footwork being performed, which would reduce the, the requirement on the, the biological tissues in the lower limb. Also, that the midsole compression may offset the amount of ankle work needing to be performed as well. So with both of these studies, or with all three of these studies, I do have some acknowledgments uh, to Dr. Ben Oneg, Sandro Nig and Dr. Vincenz von Charner and advising me throughout these uh, projects and also discussions that I've had with my advisor, Dr. Carl Zellick, and also former and current Nig Lab members. So Friedrich Kraft and Florian Ostermeyer were both involved with that first study over the long duration run. And Jordan Vianu, Emily Mativich, and Ashna Supermanium, you guys were so instrumental in those second studies and thank you for your help with those. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for the um, interesting talk. So now if you could unshare your screen, if you don't mind, so we could see everyone, it'd be great. Thank you. 
I would also, also I would like to kindly encourage everyone to um, turn on your camera if you feel okay with it. Um, so I, I, think, I think we could then have a more active discussion period. Thanks for doing that. So if you have any questions for our speaker, please use the icon raise hand button, which can be found if you go click reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If your Zoom version is different and it doesn't show you a button there, please also feel free to send me a message via Zoom chat and I'll call on you when it's your turn. Now the floor is open for the questions. Yes, Reed, please go ahead. Hi, Eric. So you did an experiment where people, you ran people to fatigue, but I assume that they just ran in like a regular shoe? So they all ran in a standard shoe. Okay. Well, and then you ran an experiment where people ran in different, in different shoes. And then you ran another experiment where two people ran in even different shoes than that. Is that correct? That is correct. So I guess it just help me draw the line here. I'm, I apologize if I missed it. You're saying that fatigue changes power at the ankle and shoes change power at the ankle. So shoes are, these shoes are gonna be beneficial in terms of the fatigue related changes that occur? Or is this an injury preventative approach that you're trying to take? I'm just trying to figure, let me, let me ask it a different way. What's the end goal of this research? So I would say that the end goal is to understand the, uh, and the first study was to understand how running and long duration running, not necessarily fatiguing running, but just long duration running affects the, uh, the person. So in that case, the reduction in the amount of ankle positive work would indicate that as a runner continues on throughout a run that they're actually becoming metabolically less efficient. And that's because the work is being transitioned to less optimal sources. So in Sano's original paper, they showed that this work was actually transferred more towards the hip and the knee, uh, which would not be as metabolically optimal as the foot, or not the foot, sorry, as the ankle. So the ankle is really good at what it does. Um, and so- if it, if That's a whole can of worms right there. I'm just curious, what, what's the end goal of this research? Are you going to have people run in the first experiment in different shoes? Is it an injury preventative approach that you're trying to take? I don't understand the connection between the three studies. I, I guess I just want you to put a pin in why you're doing this type of research. Performance. Okay, thank you. Art, I see you have a question for Eric. Uh, yeah, and Eric actually already addressed part of it. I was just curious, um, I was really interested in, in uh, how things change over time as a person runs. And I was just curious uh, about what happens in the rest of the body. And, and you were talking about that transition with the, the other joints, but also just overall work, because uh, I, I wondered, you know, people could say take shorter steps and they could reduce the amount of work per step, but just take more steps per time. And I'm just wondering, um, how, how do your results for the foot fit in with what's happening overall in a stride, how much work is done elsewhere, and then also, uh, is, is that work staying consistent or is it changing? So I would say in my first study that I didn't actually examine the hip and the knee joint work. So I would say that there is probably some redistribution going on, meaning that, excuse me, that the knee and the hip are actually taking up some of the slack. And this would be that less metabolically efficient sources are actually starting to come into bigger play. Now, in terms of say, differences in stride frequency, that was something that we did not observe was that all of these, uh, pretty much there was a, a similar stride frequency uh, from the beginning to the end of the run for these runners. Great, thanks. Um, Eric, let me actually ask you a question as well. Um, since I'm not super familiar with how to calculate foot 
power. Um, so according to what you quickly showed in the previous slide is that you said there are um, like a various factors that could contribute and that could be used for foot power calculation. And um, a few things that I saw is that um, soft tissue and mistarsal and metatarsal phalangeal or, or MP joints. Um, can you actually calculate each contribution um, accurately based on the phase of the running? Like how, how each component, um, yes, that's slide. So I'm just curious how much it, how each component contributes to the foot power um, cal calculation here. So thank you for that question. Uh, we cannot actually parse out these individual uh, contributions. So what this foot power is, is a net estimate of everything that's going on in the foot. So say you could be theoretically having, say, absorption being performed by the soft tissues with simultaneous uh, positive power being performed by the mid-tarsal joint. And so we can't necessarily differentiate using this method between those different sources. In order to get at that, you'd have to perform, say, a multi-segment foot model where researchers apply markers all over the foot um, in order to understand how these different foot joints are moving. Um, and then you'd probably need to also have some additional force sensors in order to understand where the, the center of pressure is. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see Benno, you have a question for Eric. Eric, could you go to the curve where you have the work of the soft materials deformation? Yeah. So what the bottom right curve what you have there is something happening at the beginning and then a recoil happening at the end. What mechanism holds the whole system in that, you could call it equilibrium, in the mid stance? Meaning that there is, say, this constant compression in the mid stance here? So this, I viewed this as just a snapshot in time, is that let's just say that you modeled the midsole as a, as a simple spring, and let's just say that we modeled this at the heel. So this would not necessarily indicate, say, 100% of stance time at the very end here, but say this would maybe be 40% of stance. And so... You say may that, have, say, say that again. So this the angle, point is forty percent of stance. Is that what you said? Yes. So this, that that is all happening before mid stance. Yes. So you have the recoil happening before mid stance. Is that good? I don't know if this is good or bad for the for the runner. But if you would have to construct a shoe, wouldn't you want to have the energy returned at the second half of the ground contact? For sure. So uh, I think the best uh, mechanism that I've seen at this was actually built by our Quo's group, where they had a prosthesis that stored energy at heel contact and then actually retur returned that energy near push off. And I think that you have to have this really clever mechanism maybe at play here in order to store and return energy at the correct time. What is, that being, clever, what is that clever mechanism? It's a ratchet and pawl mechanism. So basically uh, near foot contact, a ratchet uh, compresses and keeps a spring compressed near the heel. And then 
becomes it that spring is released near toe off through a pawl and uh, is able to add to the push off energy provided by uh, the prosthesis. Yeah, and we, we had once a shoe that was constructed like that and uh, it, it did really do that. But in the current shoes or current feet, what is that mechanism that does that? Meaning that returns the energy or has a delayed return on the energy? That it has a delayed return to energy. So here, again, I, I probably should have- I mean, you don't want what, what you have here. If that is 40%, you don't want that. You don't necessarily want the energy being returned right before mid stance. I agree. There, it could be, it could be detrimental, but I don't know that it is detrimental to the runner. It's not optimal for the runner. But in terms, I don't quite know if there is a mechanism right now in these elite shoes that allow you to store and return energy like that. I would suggest that it's not. In the current running shoes, all of them that are on the market. No, and that's why I thought it was, I think it's more interesting to maybe highlight this midsole compression because I don't know exactly what's going on with this midsole recoil if it's detrimental, if it's beneficial. And I don't think that we can actually parse that portion out with the metrics that we are using right now. Yeah, no, maybe if, as a final comment, Hochhammer, when he had that paper in 2018, where they showed the 4%, and then they said something like uh, the the most likely source of that energy gain or improvement of performance is the deformation of the material. And that was a pure, pure speculation without any support in the data that he had. Yes. Do you mind if I jump in there? Uh, I think they, they had another study that um, that they may really be using to support that, which is uh, they had people run on, uh, they ran barefoot on a treadmill under two conditions. One was bare treadmill and the other was a treadmill with, I think it was uh, say 10 millimeters of foam cushioning. And so the idea is that uh, in both conditions, you're not adding any weight to the foot. But uh, what they found is that when the people were running on the cushioned treadmill, that they saved uh, metabolic energy for running the same speed. So it's true, it, in this 2018 study, they don't really have good uh, reason to, um, to attribute to elastic properties, but I think they're, what they are talking about is their, their other study on the uh, cushioning. And how much was the amount difference between barefoot on hard and soft surface? Uh, I don't remember, but I'm sure Eric does. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up while you answer other questions. Uh, I think it was about 1.6% or something in that study. Right. Yeah, it was around 1%. Yeah, it wasn't that much. But also, Art, isn't that suggestive that um, uh, it wasn't something elastic, but more damping because their foam was not really elastic, was not really returning energy, was it? Oh, it I think a, that's a good point. Yes. The, the cushioning is material. only dissipative. Which, which would again be even more against the statement that they make. I mean, that, that was a, a basic elastic material that they used there. And right. we know that from our measurements, we know that viscoelastic materials have an advantage in, in running. We don't know why, but they have an advantage. And the, the statement that the energy, the 4% uh, 
are due to the return, storage and return of energy in the soft material of the soul. I think that's an unwarranted statement. Um, I think I saw Brent, Edward, you raise your virtual hand. Now it's gone, so I'm just curious. You have a question for Eric? Um, yeah, I have a number of questions around the EMG analysis. Um, and and mo mainly because I'm super naive to just EMG in general. So, so can you just remind me what it means, like why you separate low frequency EMG components from high frequency EMG components? So uh, we wanted to examine where the main contributors were within the frequency spectra. And so this was visually separated. And actually uh, this separation, uh, I wanna say coincidentally came about, but it provided actually a nice uh, interpretation in terms of prior literature as well. So there, in literature, there's this band between 15 and 35 hertz that's referred to as the beta band. And in this band, uh, you can interpret it in multiple ways, but one of the ways is that there are motor unit action potentials superimposing upon one another in this band. And so when you see an increase in this band, that would mean that more motor units are being activated in your EMG or as observed in your EMG signal. Okay. So, so, so just, you wouldn't expect some kind of shift in, in the median frequency of this, of these action potentials. You would just expect that the, the power at the median frequency increases like what you kind of observed. So uh, say in fatigue, uh, you would observe a shift in the median frequency, and papers have shown that this is due to this increase in the lower frequency spectra. Okay, so what does high frequency EMG reflect? If low frequency reflects action potentials, what does the high frequency reflect? So there are multiple interpretations of, of the frequency spectra, again. Uh, in the higher frequency, you can maybe think about these in terms of the muscle fiber recruitment. So say in between 50 and 100 uh, hertz would be the slow muscle fiber recruitment, whereas above 100 hertz would be the fast twitch fiber recruitment. Okay. And this, can, this is supported by some studies that uh, Wakeling has done with in actually a fish model where they can independently observe the fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Okay. So so then so then what you what I think you showed was that the positive work at the ankle increased over the course of the run. It decreased. Oh it, it okay so it, it decreased over the course of the run. And then and then but the low frequency EMG activity at the TA did something completely different. It like, it didn't really, it, to me, it looked like it did one thing at the beginning of the run and then completely changed for the rest of the run. Yes. So, so you started, and so is, is your interpretation that that increase in EMG activity is somehow can somehow be attributed to the reduction in ankle joint work? So I don't think that this is affiliated be, with the reduction in ankle joint work. Okay. Because it's so much, this change is so much earlier in stance. So we're seeing a difference in the amount of ankle joint work or ankle joint power in later stance from 50 to 100% of stance. Whereas this change is going on in say before foot contact to even 50% of stance time. So this would affect, if it would affect the ankle, uh, ankle power, we would tend to see something different in the negative amount of ankle work being performed. So here, let me, let me go to that slide real quick.
So we would expect if the TA was going to be mediating something at the ankle here in terms of changing the amount of work, we'd expect something different in the early stance phase. And we actually saw no differences, uh, no statistical differences in the negative work being performed by the ankle. Okay. So I guess this is my last question then. So thanks for getting me here, <laughs> walking me through this. So, so this change in TEA activity that you observed in no way reflects the, the changes that you see in ankle joint work and then consequently would probably not influence the metabolic cost of of running? Uh, it may not met, uh, influence the metabolic cost of running here. I, um, I wouldn't hypothesize. Okay. Okay, thanks. But I, th I still think that this is interesting and something different, maybe something that we don't yet understand what's going on at the TA. And I think that Roger Noka has like a very good review paper on concentric versus eccentric contractions. And he hypothesizes in this review paper that different motor units are activated when you perform a concentric versus an eccentric contraction. And this could be what's going on here, is that we see a difference in terms of an eccentric contraction being performed by the tibialis anterior after foot contact whereas we see an eccentric or an eccentric or sorry sorry a concentric contraction being performed before foot contact i wish you wouldn't have said that now i'm totally lost so you think that there's concentric contraction of the tibialis anterior after foot contact no sorry let me rephrase that because i did a such a poor job at that there is concentric contractions being performed by the tibialis anterior before foot contact. Oh, prior to, okay. Is this foot? Okay. After foot contact, there's an eccentric contraction being performed to lower the foot down onto the ground. Okay. And we're smart enough to know that we should recruit high frequency motor units to do the concentric work before heel strike but we should recruit low frequency units to do the eccentric work after heel strike. This could be one hypothesis, yes. Okay, thanks. Walter, please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Thanks for a very nice talk. Very, very clear talk, uh, Eric. Um, since we talk about eccentric and concentric contractions, can you quickly define for me uh, what you understand under eccentric contraction? Uh, meaning that the uh, muscle tendon unit is, uh, in terms of an eccentric contraction, a that is lengthening, and then concentric contraction that is shortening. Mm -hmm. So, if uh, the tibialis anterior was lengthening the muscle tendon unit, but the muscle fascicles would be shortening, and the sarcomeres would be shortening, you would call that an eccentric contraction. Who? Uh, I would have to think about that one. Yeah, because uh, Rob Griffiths, who is here, did fabulous work on cat medial gastrocnemius muscle, the first one to ever use sonomicrometry in the cat medial gastrocnemius. He showed very nicely that when a cat steps down, they have a big eccentric contraction of the muscle tendon unit while the, um, while the fascicles shorten at the same time. So then, so it's something to think about. The other, the other thing I was, work, was wondering when you, you know, when you observed less ankle work uh, over time there, um, I was wondering if you tried to figure out, you know, work is kind of a force uh, displacement type of a term. Did you try to figure out if it was a less mean force that you had and that's why the work was less or that the excursion, the, the, the shortening was less or, or a little bit of both or did you look into that? Uh, so I want to say, and I can double check and follow up with you on this, that sure. the amount of ankle moment actually decreased. So that the moment wasn't ex uh, going out as far yeah. beyond the foot. Yeah, so the, the, so the uh, excursion was similar and the moment was down. 
Okay, yeah, that's good. And the other thing, you know, a lot of people have already talked about the EMG, and uh, I thought it was too bad that that you only showed the um, the frequency content uh, because the frequency content is good, but but I, I I think there's a lot in the absolute signal, just in the time, the time signal, and you know when you run longer, or when you run when you go from slower to faster, which you showed at one point as well. Uh, I would assume that you just uh, tend to recruit more and more of the muscles uh, when, you long run, when you run longer and you get fatigued, you need more muscle activation. And so I was wondering if your changes in, um, in frequency content would actually be nicely paralleled by uh, increases in the magnitude of the EMG. Sorry, I have a slide for you, Walter. Uh, I don't need a slide, just you can tell me. <laughs> so here on the top plot, we have the overall intensity, which is the area underneath the curve. So of okay. so area under the curve. So this is kind of an integrated linear envelope type of an integration of an EMG? Yes. Okay. And so here uh, on the left-hand side is at 2.8 meters per second mm -hmm. from the beginning of the run to the end of the run. Mm -hmm. And we see that this overall intensity is increasing. Uh, this was not a statistical increase. And we see that this was uh, fairly consistent. And now we have here the 90% of the 10K velocity, 100% of the 10K velocity, and our fastest speed, the 110% of our 10K velocity. Mm -hmm. And in each of these conditions, there is an increase. And like you said, and as you hypothesized, that there is actually an increase in this activation as the speed increases because this 110% speed is higher than the 2.8 meters per second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. That, that makes a lot of sense. That would kind of, yeah, would have expected that. The other, the other thing that I wanted to quickly discuss and, and other people already did it as well, but I have kind of my own little input there and that's, you know, the, the compression of the soul. And I wonder if anybody has ever like measured local compression and decompression of the soul because you know you said you used all rear foot runners and again never having done the analysis I would assume that you have a lot of pressure right at the beginning on the rear foot and then you go a little bit more than the forefoot and by the end you're all on the on the forefoot on the toes and so you know you have a 30 centimeter long foot and I would assume that initially you compress the back and then that is decompressed as the middle compresses and then decompresses into the front. And so, so I, you know, kind of when you show that graph and also when you talk with Benno about, you know, like initial compression and final compression, because I assume that you continuously throughout the stance phase will compress certain parts of the soul and decompress other parts of the soul. And therefore, you know, what does it mean when you say you compress at the beginning and then it's all done and then you release all at the end, that that must be kind of an overall thing, but I would assume locally uh, it happens nicely as, an, as a time series as you go forward. And I wonder if anybody has ever looked at that. So I understand what you're saying. And it's almost like a caterpillar effect that you're like going, yep. you're continuously decompressing and compressing different parts of the soul. And what I was talking about with Benno and and my analogy there is meant to be only at one local region that you are going to be storing and returning locally just in one area. Now, in terms of this analysis, I can fairly definitively say during that early stance phase with uh, rear foot runners that this is just going to be, that negative power is just going to be from that shoe compression going on. And that's because there's no other, uh, let's say, work sources at play. So the mid-tarsal joint doesn't really activate or start uh, its negative power until about 20% of stance. And then the MTP joint doesn't start until around 60% of stance. And so I can definitively say something about just the sole or just the compression of the shoe in that first 20% of stance. Now I can't say something definitive or as definitive as we go on throughout the gait cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, 
yeah, no, that makes sense. I was just wondering if anybody had carefully looked at that. And and maybe a last comment that I wanted to make, and I made that a, a couple of months ago when somebody was talking about the ankle joint and about fatigue. And again, I have no idea how this is for other runners, but I've run many races and I get tired in my knees, in my quadriceps. I've never ever gotten slower or given up a race because my ankle or my hip muscles were tired, but my knee extensors are tired. And therefore I'm always surprised when I see that more than 50% of the work comes from the smallest muscle group that I have available and I don't get tired there. And if I were to study fatigue in runners, um, I would probably study what happens at the knee joint because that's, at least for me, that's the limiting factor, not the ankle joint, not the hip joint, but just a comment. <laughs> Um, I see Michael, you have a question for Eric. Yeah, thanks for the nice presentation, Eric. Um, I was wondering for uh, if you could answer some questions, time series data. Uh, in one of the graphs with footwork, where you had the, the time series on the one and then a bar graph on the other, it appeared that there weren't any changes in the uh, foot power and peak foot power, but there were changes in the work. So are there changes in the, it appears then that there must be changes in contact time that are occurring with the different footwear conditions. Is this true? So this graph here. Uh, sorry, the footwear one, not the time one. <clears throat> Uh, the later studies where you were investigating the, the effects of footwear. Okay. Yeah. Are you thinking about this one? Yeah, probably something like this, like something on the, like maybe this left-hand side one. Um, like, cause, cause all your, your, uh, all your figures are time normalized. So I was wondering if you, one, had any non-normalized, uh, time series plots of the, the changes in foot power, uh, over time, uh, in the different shoe conditions. So I currently don't have, uh, I don't have those plots available right now. So like I said, that this is still some ongoing study. So Right now, in this study, we just had nine out of 14 subjects uh, processed so far. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of foot contact time, uh, you know, this would be integrated over that, uh, the foot contact time. So it's not integrated with, re with respect to stance. That's the only, like, stick I can give you on that one. Yeah, that's okay. I, I mean, I, I assume that if you have a taller stack height and your midsole is deforming more, it's going to, it's going to occur over a longer period of time. So but, I would, I would, uh, I would assume so as well. Okay. And then, so I guess following on to that is, do you think there's an upper limit for how much footwork can be done by a shoe? Like I can conceivably continue, continue to increase the stack height of a shoe, but at some point it has to become detrimental. Do you have any idea what that might be? Like you've tested a wide variety of shoes at this point, but so far it seems to only be getting better. So this offsetting effect seems to be fairly continuous so far. You know, so IAAF, you know, set a limit on stack height and which is uh, 40 millimeters. And I don't think that we're going to, be de going to be testing shoes in the future that have a stack height more than 40 millimeters. Though I think that you're starting to run into some other problems if you get over, you know, that 40 millimeter mark, say, you know, some ankle stability issues by chance and in terms of the extra weight that you're carrying. Mm -hmm. May I make a comment here? Please, Benno. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, the height of the heel and the material under the heel may not only be important for deformation, it may be important to position the foot differently. And if you want to do the teeter-totter effect, you know that that pressing effect, it may be advantageous if you are with the heel in a higher position. So it could be that that plays a role too. 
So in terms of your question, I don't, I haven't really seen anybody, let's say bottom out a shoe. I think maybe in some of Benno's older studies where they examined really soft shoes, uh, like say a shore hardness of 35, I think I read in some of the studies that they were actually starting to bottom out some of the shoes. Is that correct, Benno? That's correct, it was 25. Oh, I apologize. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it is very soft and it's bottom out. Yeah, so there, there is a lower limit in terms of you know, how soft that these shoes need or can be, we'll say. And, and there starts to be some detrimental effects when you start bottoming out. Yeah, that, that was kind of my, my thought was that there must be some limit where beyond this, it becomes it no longer a performance benefit and in fact, a performance hindrance. hindrance. Mm. Yes. Uh, but I just wasn't sure if that, if that was known yet. I don't spend a lot of time in footwear. So with these high performance shoes, I don't think that they are trying to bottom them out. Uh, you know, that's not going to be the intention of Nike is to, you know, induce any type of, you know, unsatisfactory uh, user experience with their shoe, whether it's bottoming out or something else. Hmm. Cool, I think that covers all my questions. That's, you know, thanks. I see Walter, you have a question uh, just or a, comment? Just a quick follow-up comment, you know, with uh, uh, increasing the heel height and that might be mechanically beneficial. Uh, it would also tend to shorten, I would assume, the, um, the triceps sura muscles. And the triceps sura muscles tend to work on the ascending limb of the force length relationship. So, um, so if you made them shorter, then they would be weaker. And so uh, building, you know, so from a muscle point of view, building up heel height might not be, might not be so beneficial. I think... It Real quick, just as a response to that, I think a lot of these shoes not necessarily build up uh, just the heel height. So the entire stack height of these shoes are a okay. lot taller. Oh, I misunderstood that. I thought uh, you wanted to uh, introduce a little bit of slant there. I misunderstood that then. Rob, you have a question for Eric? Yes. Um, Eric, we have two different ways of running. Um, we can run heel toe and or we can run on our toes. Um, I remember I did my PhD on kangaroos and I thought, well, I'm going to go and run on my toes. And that was when I was a young guy. And um, in five days, I taught myself to run on my toes and I never went back. And I'm just wondering whether you have an opinion are we running on our heels and doing heel toe because we've got shoes and the shoes are driving us to run heel toe because the alternate technique of running on our toes. I remember Benno gave a seminar in 1986 that I saw showing that um, running on your toes was much less impulse on the joints and was a, a gentler system to run. I'm, I'm wondering whether all this shoe work, do you have an opinion? Are the shoes driving us to run heel toe? And maybe um, we're going the wrong way. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I can share an opinion, yes. On it. And I think that, yes, shoes may be driving us to be running more heel to toe. Whereas I think, uh, let's just say before, maybe a hundred years ago, when we started making these new and different shoes and people were maybe more running barefoot or even before that, that the longitudinal arch provides a very nice absorbing mechanism in the forefoot. 
that you can store and return energy through this mechanism. And I think I, uh, I want to recall that I've seen literature that as people wear shoes more, that the, actually the intrinsic foot muscles atrophy. Now that could actually be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I've seen this research. And so I think that the heel, like these deformable heels are maybe taking the place of say what the foot function used to be during early stance. So do you think that's a good thing or, or should we um, uh, go with the, the, the design that the uh, that runners maybe were meant to be toe runners? I, I suppose maybe the only way to look at that, I've often thought if you went into some wild, you know, a population of humans that have not been exposed to shoes, if they're all toe runners, and I'm sure there are people here who've, who've met this, um, uh, maybe John Bertram or Ryan might be familiar with it, um, whether they only run toe, in which case maybe we should be looking at a completely different shoe. So I would say from, let's just say a muscle cost perspective, if you recruit more muscles to perform the same task that you're going to be metabolically less efficient at what you do. So yeah. if shoes eliminate the need to activate certain muscles, then you start to reduce the cost associated with running. Even if these muscles are small muscles, there's still a cost that is impending on the system. So I would say oh. that shoes may be beneficial uh, with respect to that. But, you know, I think that there are some very strong opinions in the research community about forefoot versus rear foot running in terms of performance and injury prevention. May I make a comment to that? Yes, please. I mean, forefoot running and rear foot running with respect to loading of the human skeleton. It's not so that forefoot running has less loading in the system itself. It's just loading at a different location. That's the first comment. So that the loading cannot be a reason why you should change from one to the other one. And the second thing is Lieberman, uh, who is one of the protagonists of uh, forefoot running, they did a study with uh, some native people somewhere and let them run, walk and run on natural ground. And they had, I forgot the number, but it was a very high percentage of people landing on the heel by running. It uh, was published around 10 years ago. So I don't think it's correct to say running on the forefoot has less loading of the human system. And I don't think that it's correct to say that forefoot running is a natural running style. I personally think that it depends much on your education. I was a track and field athlete in sprinting and I run on my forefoot because that's what you do when you sprint. And I know that Walter has problems in, in heel landing too, but he was a middle distance runner and middle distance running is not heel running per se. It's, it's cause something like a four foot, flat foot landing. So I don't think it is correct to say that it's natural to run a four foot. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah, maybe I can make a quick comment as well, since I was uh, invoked here. So, so I've been a track runner, but I only really joined a track club when I was about 16 or 17. Before that, I trained by myself. And so I had really no coach or no formal training. But I'm a, I'm a natural, like a forefoot, midfoot, I would call it midfoot striker, not really on my toes, but midfoot striker. 
but nobody ever told me that. I only realized that I was a midfoot striker the first time I was in the lab with Benno when I was like 30 years old. <laughs> and they had me run over the platform and said, you need to give us a, an impact peak. And I said, what the heck are you talking about? So then I realized that I was doing something different than a lot of people do. And, um, and for me, and I can only talk for me again as a personal opinion, for me, landing my midfoot is very, very natural. In fact, in studies that I've participated, where people ask me to do heel first running, that feels really, really, really awkward to me. It doesn't feel like running. And so I think there is people who naturally land on their midfoot or forefoot and people that land naturally on their heel. And I've always been really curious, uh, honestly curious why, why that is. Because I think some people without training and without really any special thing, they, they just do run that way. And I think there's something anatomically or muscular or something else that probably would explain that I, I, my hypothesis is that there is actually a simple explanation behind this, but I don't have it. <laughs> if I can just quickly sneak in another question here. You had a, a, a pie chart early on showing the work done by the ankle and done by other um, joints. And Walter stimulated it earlier, uh, a thought I've often had, you've got the work happening in the ankle and you say most of the work's being done in the ankle in that little muscle. So tell me, what do you think that massive quadricep and hamstring are doing if they're not doing work when you're running? So That's I think that they, question. that they are still doing work. They're just not doing, say, the amount of work. So the tricep serrae uh, has this really long and nice tendon, uh, you know, the Achilles tendon that you have probably studied in other animals as well. Uh, you know, that can provide some energy storage in return. But in terms of positive work, do you, I mean, the, the size difference between gastroc and, and the muscles of quadriceps is, is absolutely enormous. The energy yeah. expenditure must be enormously different. So what's it doing? Uh, I don't know that I can necessarily answer that in a coherent manner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can tell you that it is more efficient to perform work distally on the body in order to locomote. So Art and other researchers have shown this with simple models, that if you can perform work on, distally with respect to the body, that it's more efficient. Say, if you compare doing work in walking between the ankle and the hip, the hip is four times as more costly. Yeah, I, a difficult question. Yeah, I'm happy. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I see David, you have a question for Eric. Hey, hey Eric, uh, thank you for the talk. I found this very interesting. Um, uh, I guess my question kind of relates to, uh, uh, your study looked at uh, people running on flat uh, elevate or flat ground basically, uh, which I guess it definitely coincides with breaking too since that, since Eli Kipchoge broke it all on flat. But I'm kind of curious, uh, what what could we do on a different uh, uh, incline? Say if a marathon had more uphills and downhills, um, could you, uh, what, what kind of uh, um, shoe do you think could uh, optimally uh, work with downhills versus uphills courses? So let me rephrase this in a little bit different way, if that's all right. So I think that there are starting to be some innovations in the realm of, let's say, trail running. Um, and in terms of that, uh, I think some of these innovations are actually coming through the lacing systems in order to actually have the shoe and the foot be, or the shoe mean the midsole 
and the foot be more, uh, let's say, moving as one rather than, say, if you step on a rock that the midsole is going to roll off. And so there's some more innovations with regards to the, up, uh, the upper with respect to, say, trail running. Now, in terms of flatter ground running, um, there are some new and different and interesting looking shoes for downhill running where there's this huge stack height uh, that basically is just intended to uh, absorb as much, as much as possible when you're running downhill. Now, that shoe would not be very good when you're running uphill because uh, you're carrying a lot of extra weight. You're not, no longer actually using that shoe. And so I think that there still needs to be some research in terms of making a better all-terrain, meaning uh, better shoe for different slopes as well. I do not yet know of any research going on, uh, maybe examining the vapor flies or similar high performance shoes on running on different slopes yet. Yeah, so um, I, I really like that, um, that you mentioned the, the very uh, thick, uh, stack height of those uh, downhill uh, um, shoes because uh, Greg Sawicki from Georgia Tech a couple of weeks ago gave a good talk on how we can translate biologically inspired uh, movement into exoskeletons. And so um, since just a normal shoe that uh, has a, a huge stack width or height, um, you can't really make use of that, that energy uh, going uphill, um, but so do you envision, say, maybe uh, storing that in some sort of augmentation exoskeleton um, so that in other stages of the run, perhaps like on uphill, then it could be utilized? Um, and then also on the, the picture you just showed on the previous question, um, where it was showing also how the knee was absorbing a lot of uh, um, power. Um, and that usually, that typically happens during downhill as well. So perhaps, uh, on the downhills, the knee could be an energy source uh, to be captured uh, for, for later in the run. Um, so uh, the, way, the way I kind of see it is that like, uh, as for now, the vapor flies are, are the shoe of choice to break to on a flat surface, but perhaps it will take something like an augmentation exoskeleton that can uh, induce some sort of variable stiffness um, and collect uh, energy at different uh, downhill portions, and then uh, that could be the first type of uh, uh, wearable kind of shoe for a, a, a like a, a sloped kind of uh, marathon that could break too. Um, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I know maybe exoskeletons isn't really like your uh, to area topic, but uh, running is, so I, I kind of wanted to just hear your perspective on that. So Max Donnellan actually has an exoskeleton right now that can absorb energy when you're walking downhill. And so this has been really developed uh, in terms of military use where they can use this exoskeleton to dissipate energy when you're going down and can generate positive work when you're going up. So I think that that is uh, you know, a really interesting source. I think also my PhD advisor, Carl Zellick, really wants to create, say, a exoskeleton sock that what he wants to get it banned from the Olympics because you know that would mean that he's successful at augmenting humans. Uh, and I think that you know there is this line between say exoskeletons and shoes and I don't quite know where that line is in running yet. Uh, so you know I'm a, a climber personally there's a lot of debate in climbing, say around knee bar pads, if people are familiar, basically it's creating this really frictiony surface on your knee. So then you can say, stick your knee in between crevices and basically hang there for a really long time. That would be an exoskeleton I view. And I don't know if uh, running it is going to start going the same way, say with compression tights or something like that where you are mitigating work being performed at certain joints, um, say at the knee or something. Uh, but I theoretically think that's possible. Um, I see Brent, you have a last question for Eric. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk, Eric. Um, I just had a quick question about the mechanism that this 
is shoes um, used to reduce the cost of running. And I was wondering if it's as simple as the more compliant shoes actually maximize the ground contact time and therefore minimize the requirement to generate force rapidly. And I was wondering if you could comment on if that could potentially be plausible. Uh, so that I, <laughs> sorry, let me collect my thoughts here. Um, I think that there are more mechanisms at play than just increasing the amount of ground contact time. So I think that there, I just tried to explain maybe a couple mechanisms that are at play today with, in terms of the dissipation with, uh, with the midsole and with these carbon fiber plates. Now, I think that the curvature of the carbon fiber plate is really, really essential in these shoes. So there are studies out of Nike that show that these curvatures are these curved carbon fiber plates um, basically reduce, I wanna say, actually, sorry. They maintain the same ankle moment. So whereas flat carbon fiber plates increase your ankle moment, curved carbon fiber plates don't increase your ankle moment. And so that is one aspect that I think is really essential is this curved carbon fiber plate in terms of how beneficial it can be to performance. So various labs and including ours, including Darren's definitions and other groups have shown that flat carbon fiber plates can reduce the amount of uh, metabolic cost by about 1%. So, and that is with increasing the force or requiring more force capacity on the tricep surrey. So including a curved carbon fiber plate wouldn't increase that force uh, requirement on the tricep surrey, but um, could also provide these energetic benefits as well. So I think this is a multifactorial question um, and not just about stance time, but a lot of about a lot of different mechanisms that are at play in these shoes. Thanks, Eric. On that note, I would like to thank Eric again for giving great talk and very much enjoyable discussion as well. Next week, we will hear from Baba Otu, and the title of our talk is Real-Time Chondrocyte Volume Matrix Strain Changes During the Unloading Phase of Dynamic Loading. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you all next week.